hello everyone and welcome tonight. Tonight is January the 15th, 2023, and my name is Glenn Rawson. I remember this date because it was on this date in 1935 that my dear sweet mother was born. She is still alive and lives in Pocatello, Idaho, and is probably uh, healthier than I am. Anyway, welcome tonight. I'm, I'm appreciate, appreciative that you're here and joining me. Uh, I just wanted to extend a word of thanks and uh, remind you of a couple of things as we begin tonight. There are two Facebook pages that these firesides broadcast to. One of them is Glenn Ross and Stories, and the other one is History of the Saints. If you wouldn't mind, would you take a moment and follow both of those pages? Because there, there has been and there will yet be stories posted to both of those pages that you can pick up, just download and use as you will. It's kind of like an extra bonus if you follow the page. So please do that. The second thing I wanted to remind you of, and I'm assuming since I haven't received any emails uh, or text messages, that you can hear me all right. Let's see. Okay. All right. Looks like you can hear me okay. The second thing is, if you're interested in going on a church history tour with me through Fun for Less, I'm doing a full church history tour from Philadelphia to Nauvoo, one in May and another in July. And you are invited to come. If you're interested in going on one of these full meal deal church history tours, go to funforlesstours.com. And then also through Fun for Less, on the 25th of August, I'm taking a group to the British Isles on a land tour from Dublin through the island, both islands, all the way down to London. So that's through Fun for Less Tours. I'll talk more about tours later on. And also, I... I got to tell you, this book is still available. Tempering Steel is the first and only fictional work I've ever done. And uh, I've had such glowing reviews on it. I'm excited. I'm working on the sequel right now, doing the research. But this is still available. It's a good read, especially for someone who would um, is struggling with church in general or perhaps even with the prophet Joseph Smith. This book is available at glenrossonstories.com and at historyofthesaints.org, as is this one. If there is anyone you know who is struggling with their testimony of, that Joseph Smith is a prophet and of the restoration, other than the Book of Mormon, I recommend this book. Why? Because it's the first-hand, first-hand account testimonies of those who saw and knew that Joseph was a prophet. Not just his character and personality. They saw him in action as a prophet. This book is full of stories about that, and it's available at historyofthesaints.org. All right, now, as always, I ask you to have a prayer in your heart tonight for me, and for those that are listening, that something will be said that might be of benefit. This first story I want to share, Tess Rawlinson shared it with me, and I was so moved by it, because it, it teaches a powerful doctrine about prayer that you don't very often hear, and it's summed up at the end. She said, in the spring of 1940, Patrick Fenton graduated with honors from the University of Utah with his ROTC class. Ahead of him still lay one more year of law school. As expected, he received a commission in the United States Army and was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He was there at Fort Sill December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Patrick, of course, was soon on his way to the fighting, which caused his mother, Melita McAllister Fenton, great worry. Can you imagine? Well, mother followed all the news of the war, but when letters came stateside from Patrick, there were only the fronts of the envelopes. 
the rest of the envelope, including the letters, weren't there, never came, heavily censored. Her worry and anxiety increased such that she prayed day and night for her son's safety. Her family tried to comfort and console her, but it was to no effect. She could find no peace. So deep and profound was her emotional distress that her long and lovely auburn hair turned white. Then one night, after two years of unyielding faith and prayer, Mother Fenton told her family she had received a visit from a messenger. Not much more was said, but she was at last at peace. The war ended in Europe, and Patrick Fenton came home to Parowan, Utah on a three-month furlough. He was told after those three months he would be sent to the Pacific, but before his furlough was over, the war in the Pacific ended. Patrick's daughter, Tess, relates the following. The family home had a screened back porch, part of which was used for storage. My father pulled his army gear off the porch and told his family he was giving it away. My grandmother stopped him and told him to put it back. He would be needing it again. My father was astounded. He asked her why she would think that. He had served almost five years and he still had law school to finish and the world was at peace. She then told him about her worry and her daily and hourly prayers for him. She told him a messenger came to her one night and told her that her son would live and return home. The messenger then told her that dad, this is Tess speaking, would leave again in the future to fight an Asian war and assured grandma that dad would return safely again. My father said he just stared at his mom, but did as he was told, returning his gear to the porch. End of quote. Well, Patrick went back to school, completed his law degree, got married and opened his law practice and became the commanding officer of the newly formed 213th National Guard Artillery Unit in Cedar City, Utah. Tess continued, quote, Then came the Korean War, and the 213th was activated. My father very suddenly remembered the conversation with his mother when he returned from World War II. He temporarily closed his law office, and my father took the young men of the 213th National Guard to Korea. During the time he was there with his unit, he never lost a soldier. The prayers offered so long ago by his devoted and worried mother were answered then and through the years. And then Tess said, My grandmother was a very prayerful and faithful woman. And then here it is. Tess makes this powerful and profound conclusion. Think about this. My grandmother's prayers have shaped the lives of her family in many ways, and I feel they still are. End of quote. Wow. All right, this next story. For those of you... I'm sorry, that are in Scotland or New York or even parts of southern Utah, Arizona, Texas, this story isn't going to have the same meaning to you that it does to me and others of us that live up to the north. The story is titled Tin Cup. Thomas Perry was born in Wales in 1845. By late 1861, Thomas had immigrated and was settled in Brigham City, Utah, with his mother and his siblings. Now, being the oldest boy in the family, Thomas felt the need to help support his mother and family, so he began hauling freight from Corinne, Utah, to Butte, Montana, a distance of 355 miles. Thomas was just a teenager, and that's rough work. Well, on one of those trips, he stopped to camp at a summit about 20 miles north of what is today Soda Springs, Idaho. Here, Thomas met some men, who were running horses north from Mexico into Montana. 
The men all set to bartering and trading, and when it was all over, Thomas acquired a beautiful Spanish saddle and a unique collapsible tin cup. A couple of days later, up the trail, Thomas went looking for his cup. He couldn't find it. He remembered that he'd used it to take a drink from the creek on the day he got it. It must still be there. He wanted it back. So he started telling the other freighters about his tin cup lost in the canyon on the stream, and if anyone found it, would they please leave it at the freight office in Corinne? Thomas never saw the cup again. But he had told enough people that the word spread. You know how these things work. People started calling the pass, the canyon, even the creek, tin cup. Today, that beautiful, pristine area of southeast Idaho is known as tin cup. And now, <laughs> the sequel to the story. In 2010, the great-grandson of Thomas Perry, Kim Moss, who gave me this story, and Kim's son, Jason, were exploring the area of Tin Cup and needed directions to a nearby town. Now, there were a number of homes they could have stopped at for directions, but a whisper prompted Kim to turn off the road and up a long driveway to a nearby ranch. After getting directions and visiting with the rancher for a bit, Kim was again prompted to ask the man if he knew how Tin Cup had received its name, assuming the rancher wouldn't know. And Kim was eager to share his proud heritage and the story of his great-grandpa, Thomas Perry. This man, whose ranch lies at the mouth of Tin Cup Canyon, piped up and said, I sure do. Kim, a little surprised and taken aback, listened to the man as he continued. My great-granddad was exploring the area to homestead. One day he rode to the top of the canyon here, got off his horse to get a drink from the stream, and found a collapsible tin cup sitting there on the top of a rock. We had it sitting here on the fireplace mantle and just a year or so ago when I gave it to my son from California and he has taken it home with him. Kim responded, Wow! Someone actually found it. My great-grandpa is the guy that lost that tin cup. End of quote. A coincidence? <laughs> Family history works more ways than one. Not a coincidence. I don't think so, and more importantly, neither does Kim. All right. <clears throat> Let me stop for a second. Still no text messages. I hope we're doing all right. Let me go check the comments really quick to make sure everything's working right. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody that was watching on History of the Saints Facebook, suddenly I went black and they can't find me because I can only go live on one at a time, so I'm sorry, here I am, and uh, equipment is so, it's so maddening. All right, now this next story is, is, is not the most positive, but it is a reminder of how far we've come and on whose shoulders we stand. Lucy Maservi Smith married George A. Smith on November 23rd, 1844. When the Latter-day Saints were driven out of Nauvoo in February 46, Lucy was among the first to leave. She described the trial of the trail in Crossing, Iowa. Quote, We encountered some very severe cold weather with very strong high winds. I can't forget how cold I was standing in the tent preparing food and washing dishes for our big family. When I would wash a dish and raise it out of the water, there would be ice on it before I could get it wiped. I could not get warm from morning till night and from night until morning. In the morning, the bed covers would be frozen stiff. One day, we traveled through rain, mud, slush all day. When night came, the mud was six inches deep and the men were completely drenched. End of quote. Lucy gave birth to a son 
at Cutler's Park in Nebraska Territory in August 1846. She gives a vivid description of the sickness that beset not only her, but many at winter quarters in the winter of 1846-47. She wrote, quote, We moved down to winter quarters when my babe was two weeks old. There we lived in a cloth tent until December. Then we moved into a log cabin, 10 feet square with a sod roof, chimney, and the only a soft ground for a floor. And the poor, worn cattle, beef, and corn cracked on a hand mill for our food. Here I got scurvy, not having any vegetables to eat. I got so low I had to wean my baby, and he had to be fed on that coarse, cracked cornbread when he was only five months old. We had no milk for a while till we could send to the herd, and then we then he did very well till I got better. My husband took me in his arms and held me till my bed was made nearly every day for nine weeks. I could not move an inch. Then on the 9th of February, I was 30 years old. I had nothing to eat but a little cornmeal gruel. I told the folks I would remember my birthday dinner when I was 30 years old. My dear baby used to cry till it seemed as though I would jump off my bed when it came night. I would get so nervous, but I could not even speak to him. I was so helpless. I could not move myself in bed or speak out loud. When I got better, I had not a morsel in the house I could eat, as my mouth was so sore. I could not eat cornbread, and I have cried for hours for a morsel to put in my mouth. Then my companion would take a plate and go around among the neighbors and find someone cooking maybe a calf's pluck. He would beg a bit to keep me from starving. I would taste it, and then I would say, Oh, do feed my baby. My appetite would leave me when I would think of my dear child. My stomach was hardening from the want of food. The next July, 1847, my darling boy took sick, and on the 22nd, the same day that his father and Orson Pratt came into the valley of the Great Salt Lake, my only child died. I felt so overcome in my feelings. I was afraid I would lose my mind as I had not fully recovered from my sickness the previous winter. End of quote. My dear friends, winter quarters is a vital part of our sacred history. It was a time and a place when our people were sorely tried and tested. It is important that we do not forget what they suffered for our sake and for our present comfort. All right. <clears throat> the story that I just shared about Lucy Masservi Smith and Winter Quarters will be in the new History of the Saints book coming out sometime late this year about winter quarters. Now again, I wanted to thank all of you weekly subscribers. Now, in case you don't know what that means, there are those who have uh, signed up to receive a weekly email from me with one of these stories, a written copy and a video copy. And it's perfectly free. You don't. It doesn't cost you a thing. And I am grateful to all of you weekly subscribers. And I would ask you, if you are enjoying the stories, would you please refer them to a friend and get them to receive the stories as well? These st I don't receive a thing for those weekly subscriptions. Those are free. What matters is that, the, that those stories, your stories, go around the world and edify where they're needed. Now, I wanted you to know that I am working on this Hymn Stories book, Volume 2, Me and Gene Tonioli. And one of the stories, that, in fact, a couple of the stories that are about to follow will be in that Volume 2 of the Hymn Stories book. And I am pleased to announce, coming up in May, Local Tours of the Valleys of the Mountains. Jason and I are putting together a tour. There will be actually three or four different tours 
of the great valleys of the Rocky Mountains of the Pioneer Era. First of all, the Salt Lake Valley, then Utah Valley, then Cache Valley. These will each be a tour in and of themselves. We'll tour historic sites and places and stories and cemeteries and tabernacles all through these different valleys as we talk about the history of our pioneers in the settlement of Utah. Those tours will be available at glenrossonstories.com. Keep an eye out. There'll be more information coming. George Manwaring was born March 19th, 1854 in Cheshire, England. When he was nine, his family joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When George was 17, his family emigrated to Utah. In his young years, George only had the opportunity to attend law school or attend school for a few weeks. But when he died at the age of 35, George Manwaring was a very well-educated man. He took advantage of every opportunity to read good books, borrowing from his employer and other books of every kind. As part of his course of self-education, George mastered penmanship, stenography, mathematics, and literature. But where George made his indelible mark on the ages was in his music and poetry. It was said of George, he was a music teacher of rare ability. Never having had a music lesson in his life, he was able to play piano or organ and to teach, all of which he did by ear. He traveled extensively over the state and in practically every ward in the state taught the children music. Now, in his adult years, George worked in the retail grocery business, but then came an opportunity where he was in the atmosphere he loved best. He went to work as a traveling salesman for the Calder Music Company in Salt Lake. While doing that, he rented a small second-story studio apartment in Farmington, where he would paint and compose songs. George traveled all about Utah, selling music and instruments. Speaking of his artistic hideaway, his daughter gives us this revealing glimpse. Quote, Early mornings would find him, George, head-bent, walking slowly along the twisting path, oblivious to the red and white apple blossoms in the surrounding orchards. His agile brain, wrestling with the problem of rhyme and meter, of poem and verse, Frustration often walked with him on these solitary sojourns. He felt very keenly at these times his lack of music fundamentals. He never had a music lesson in his life, but he was a gifted and talented man. And the music of his poems, the depth of feeling personified in his songs, came not as a result of training, but from a reverent and grateful heart. He wrote many songs. Scarcely a Sunday passed that one or more of his compositions were not sung in church. End of quote. Well, according to the family records, it was while George Manwaring was traveling in Ephraim, Utah in 1878 that he was the guest of C.C.A. Christensen, the renowned pioneer artist. Christensen invited George into his studio and showed him a new work titled The Vision. It was CCA's representation of Joseph Smith's first vision. It made such an impression on George that he wrote the words and music to him. We still sing it today called Joseph Smith's First Prayer. George, the immigrant convert, was only 24 years old when he wrote the hymn. Then in March 1889, George was convicted and imprisoned on a charge of unlawful cohabitation 
where he would serve four months in the Utah State Penitentiary. He was released June 12, 1889. And then, just a little over three weeks later, July 7, 1889, George died suddenly of pneumonia. The, the, Ill, the illness had lingered until it took him. He was only 35 years old. Gone. Gone in the prime of life, but not forget, not forgotten. In addition to Joseph Smith's first prayer, we also sing these others of George's hymns. Lord, we ask thee, ere we part, sing we now at parting, tis sweet to sing the matchless love, and we meet again in Sabbath school. George Manwaring may not have had what the world calls education, but verily, he knew that which was most important. And I might add, how many testimonies do you think of Joseph and his vision have been strengthened, fortified, or even created by the hymn that George left us? Next story. I wish I could take you there. This summer, this last summer, Annie and I, my daughter, were at Bath, England, touring in that area. We saw the Roman baths. We, we saw the beautiful countryside, the, the, the vistas from Somerset in the south of England. It is a gorgeous area. Well, one day in the spring of 1863, a 29-year-old young man took a walk somewhere near Bath. Then, it says, he sat on a hilltop outside his native city, Bath, England, admiring the country view and the winding River Avon below. The beauties of nature before him stirred his soul with a profound sense of gratitude to the Lord, and in poetic rhyme, he penned these words. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. It would become the beautiful hymn for the beauty of the earth. And he would write eight stanzas of praise in his original compos composition. That young man was Foliot Sanford Pierpoint, who was born October 7th, 1835 in Bath, England. He was the son of William and Annabella Sanford Pierpoint. Is it meaningful? that this lofting hymn is published today across Christianity in 595 different hymnals. Indeed, it is. Because when those who love the Lord look upon the creations of the Almighty under the influence of His Holy Spirit, they see the Lord manifest before their very eyes. Last story for tonight. It is friendship that warms hearts and binds together individuals, families, and nations. Friendship is what happens when love is acted upon. Just how important is friendship? to the ongoing work of Almighty God. Well, please consider this story. This will be in the New Testament book, and this will also be part of your Sunday school curriculum. At the beginning of the Savior's ministry, Jesus came to John the Baptist to receive baptism. John bore witness of him as the Messiah to all who would listen. 
One day, not long after that, John saw Jesus walking nearby, and turning to two of his disciples, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, John 1.36. Curious, the two disciples began to follow Jesus. He turned and saw them following, and he said, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he answered them, Come and see. John 1, 38, 39. Well, they went with him to where he was staying, and since it was late in the day, they spent the night together. Now, the scriptures are silent as to what happened that evening, but the conversation must have been glorious, because the next day, Andrew, one of the two, set out immediately to find his brother, Simon. Quote, we have found the Messiah, Andrew announced to Simon, John 1, 41. They then brought him, Simon, to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he welcomed him, saying, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. John 1, 42. The next day, Jesus went into Galilee, and he found Philip. No sooner was Philip convinced that Jesus was the Messiah than he went out and found his best friend, Nathaniel. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, end of quote. Philip declared that. Well, Nathaniel found that just a little bit hard to believe. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth, he asked? John 1, 46. Philip's response was the answer of the ages for all seekers invited by a friend. He replied, come and see, John 1, 46. The moment Jesus saw Nathanael, he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. From that point forward, Nathanael became one of those who left all and followed the master. Please consider, friends bring friends to Christ. They always have, and they always will. And thereby the kingdom of God on the earth has grown and will yet grow. Men are saved and the work rolls forward. Moreover, just as this story illustrates, you don't need to worry about your friends. It doesn't matter who or what your friend is. The Savior will welcome him or her and put them to work. So go and tell a friend what you have found. My friends, I will put this fireside all together and post it on YouTube in a completed form for any that didn't get to finish it tonight. My friends, good night, God bless, and have a great week. We'll see you.